Today is the last day. Tell us your opinions about the YMYW podcast by 4 p.m. Pacific time today, August 31st, 2021, for your chance to win that $100 Amazon e-gift card. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to go to the show notes and access the survey using the word pure, P-U-R-E, all lowercase. U.S. residents only, no purchase necessary. Survey giveaway closes and winner will be chosen today at 4 p.m. Pacific time. Now, some YMYW listeners have had enough of the 9 to 5, and they're ready to punch early. Today on Your Money, Your Wealth podcast number 341, join Big Al Spitball on whether they are financially ready for a long and early retirement. Plus, the ever-popular Roth IRA conversions, how much to convert to Roth, when and how to pay the tax on a Roth conversion, and why not just pay Roth conversion taxes out of the retirement account you're converting from. I'm producer Andy Last, and here are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson, CFP, and Big Al Clopine, CPA. YMYW team, I really enjoy your show. Thank you for all the information you share. I started listening back in 2019 during my one-hour commute in my 2013 Mazda hatchback. But I've been mostly working from home, so now listening to your show helps me mentally separate the work time from home time since I don't commute as much. Oh. I'm 37, my wife is 41. We've saved $2.3 million tag for our early retirement. Jesus, Adam. Yeah, Good for you. That's wonderful. Uh, did you have that much at age 37? Oh, yeah. I, I, know, I know you did. <laughs> Way more than that. <laughs> Uh, they call you Big Al with the big wall. Yeah, but I guess you've got a bigger one. If if you if you're more than that, at 37. That's uh, that's impressive. That is impressive. Uh, no, nine hundred forty one thousand dollars in a taxable brokerage account, seven hundred fifty nine thousand in my company four hundred one k split between Roth and traditional, three hundred eighty three thousand dollars total in the Roths, ninety five k in the state's retirement system, and eighty seven thousand sitting in various cash accounts, sinking funds. We're investing about a hundred thousand dollars a year in these accounts. Um, about half of which is to the taxable brokerage accounts. <clears throat> Our primary residence is about $400,000. have $125,000 remaining on the mortgage, and we have a rental townhouse worth about one hundred ninety dollars uh, with no mortgage, with some small positive cash flow. We've been paying more to our mortgage, so it'll be gone if we retire early and could have it paid off in 2025 at that rate. If our tenant decides to move, I think we'll decide to sell the rental. We have two kids, 10 and 8 this year. We have $224,000 total saved for their college. Wow. <laughs> Killing uh, it. Just, what the hell are you, what's your question? <laughs> you just have <laughs> no question. on and just on, on about his assets. This is, oh, I'm, pretty, by I'm, the way. I'm pretty good, right? Yeah. Uh, I have a PhD in <laughs> mathematics. <laughs> I have no idea how much to target here, uh, but I know I want to pay for it in full. So we're aiming for about two hundred, four hundred thousand dollars total combined. We are only contributing four point eight thousand dollars per year at the moment, though. But they also get an occasional gift from family. Our average spending over the last several years is about $56,000 after taking out all the rental and mortgage expenses and not including health insurance deducted from our paychecks. Our retirement expense will have to add in health care taxes and maybe some increase for grow, <coughs> growing kids and new expenses, maybe $80,000, $90,000. After the last year, it struck me that we're possible almost there. And expenses, withdrawal rates, asset location allocation have been on my mind. Our investment goal started at $2 million and has steadily grown to more conservative $3 million over the year. Our investments are diversified stock mutual funds, some value tilt and international. I'm starting to think I need to move more into bonds. But what else should we be thinking about now that we're starting to approach the end game? Do you think our asset Allocation locations are generally set up for a long safety early retirement. How much is enough anyway? Because I keep wanting to increase our target amount. We know we're very fortunate to be in this position and we appreciate any thoughts you might share about the final few years before retirement. Thanks. All right. Adam from Florida. Um, he's spending eighty thousand, ninety thousand dollars a year. He is how old? Like thirty-seven? Yeah, thirty-seven. Wife forty-one. Okay, so he's going to retire at forty. 
call it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. A little fire. Yep. Fi- little yeah. Yeah. Fire for financial independence. Retire early. So ninety thousand dollars. I'm gonna go point three. So yeah, I agree with that. Maybe even twenty five. Yeah, he needs about three to four million dollars. Yeah, probably at least three million. So we got that by taking ninety thousand divided by 0.03. So that would be a three percent distribution rate. You've heard us talk about a four percent rate. That's that's if you're in your sixties when you're going to retire early. Maybe it's two and a half or three percent, something like that, to be a little bit safer. Yeah. So three million is your, you know, that's that's cutting it close. Yeah, and I guess he's got two point three right now, right? I believe in his targets, 3 million. Yes. I mean, close. Yeah. So if he's going to work a couple and he's saving a hundred, some thousand dollars a year. Yeah. I mean, you might have to work four years instead of three, but I mean, you're, you're, you're pretty close. Right. So I would say three, three and a half is going to, if you're spending $90,000, I know he's not spending that, but then there's healthcare. He's got older yeah. children. He's right. not working. You're 40 years old. And you're not working. What are you, what are you going to do? Well, that's a question too. Right. You got to spend, you're going to probably spend money. All right. Unless I, I don't know. Um, if it were me, I'd be spending twice as much because <laughs> I work all the time. Right. If I had more time off, I mean, I would be broke. You would. Yeah. Right. This is this is the best savings account. Just hunker down in an office for 80 hours a week and be miserable <laughs> and then go home and just drink a ton of JMO. Got it. <laughs> is that uh, from then experience? I'm, then I'm just... going to build a shop. <laughs> sort of fix it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I you're right on track. When should he start going into bonds? I would start moving into bonds shortly. If your retirement date is a couple of years out, you know, then that's kind of your, you know, five years from retirement, five years out. That's kind of what some people call yeah. right. It's, yeah, it's, and- it's getting really close. So I would want to be in the allocation that you need. And so here's a good rule of thumb: is that probably you want ten years of of bonds of income. So let's say you're spending a hundred thousand dollars. You want at least 500,000 out of your target, $3 million into bonds, because no matter what happens over the 10 years, you'll still have that hundred thousand that you can pull out, even though the rest of the portfolio is extremely volatile. If the market crashes over that next 10 years, Yes, but that's a hundred thousand for five years, right? That's 500,000. I I mean, at 40. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I would go for, what did I say? You said 10 years. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. Right. So five years would be 500. That's what I was thinking too. I mean, you, we, you can go 10 years. That's even safer, but you you know, well, then that's a million dollars out of the three. Right. Right. I mean, that's still pretty, it's it's still fairly aggressive. Yeah. One third, but, but at least, at least uh, what you're spending 90,000, we rounded a hundred times five years for, for, you know, safe money for at least five years of distributions. Yeah. That would be probably a minimum. Yep. Five, I would say 500 to a million dollars in bonds Agreed. over the next couple of years um, as you get in retirement. Yep. All right. Uh, thanks for the help on the math. And thanks for the question. And congratulations, Adam. Um, another little five-star reward here for him. <laughs> That's right. Hi, Joe and Al. Love your show. And would love to have you spitball a question for me. But first, my drink of choice is Coors Light. Coors Latte. <laughs> my man. <laughs> and I drive a Honda Civic. Uh, thank you, Joe, for making me a Coors Light drinker. Man, wow. We're, we're brothers. Wow. You you are. Yeah. Jason. Uh, my wife and I are both currently 55 and would like to retire next year. 56. Good for you, brother. Good genes running our family. Of course, you're drinking Coors Light. Yeah, that's <laughs> healthy. So I want to be conservative and plan for a 40 year retirement. We own a home, uh, $500,000 with no mortgage. Have about a million dollars in a brokerage account, nine hundred thousand dollars in an IRA, five hundred thousand dollars in a four hundred one k, and hundred thousand dollars in a Roth. Uh, the investments mirror a growth and in income mix of assets with an emphasis on value equities that pay dividends. Okay, our current combined income is about two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars a year. I believe we'll need about ninety thousand dollars after tax per year in retirement. Do you think the numbers add up for retirement next year? Uh, did you add any of this up? I did. I did. Oh, I did. Okay, I did. So it's two and a half million. Uh, okay. And if you take 90,000, if that's the right number, into you know, two and a half million, it's 3.6% distribution. Okay. Yeah. I realize I'd be looking at about a 4% withdrawal rate for the next 10 years. But at ages 67, our combined Social Security will be $4,400 a month in today's dollars, which should bring the withdrawal rate down substantially. Thanks again for putting out such a great and fun show, Jason. All right. So what, what is he missing in this calculation? 
I think there's just one small detail that Jason's missing. Um, his Social Security benefit is probably going to be off a little bit because he's retiring at 56. Well, that's a good point. And, and see, because when you get your statement, it's presuming you're working till full retirement age to get the benefit you're seeing on the statement. So Correct. That's a really good point. So, but even if it's three thousand a month instead of forty four hundred, whatever the number is, uh, it's uh, it it looks pretty good. I mean, I, I'm going to spitball this and say, Jason, I think you can retire at 56 with longevity. Um, you've done an awesome job. Don't get me wrong. A couple million bucks is a ton of cash. Uh, but you're also spending $100,000 a year, which is a pretty healthy clip. Sure. Um, let's just say that the market blows up. you got this growth strategy, a value strategy, trying to get dividends from your stocks. And then you're down 30%. Right. And you're still pulling $100,000 a year. So you're down, what, $600,000, plus you're pulling another $100,000 a year. You could blow this thing up fairly quickly uh, just because you're pretty close to that three and a half, four percent distribution at 56. Sure. We would probably like it to see at two and a half or three to be a little bit more conservative. Well, I would I would agree with you. I would say at, at 56, we'd rather have it be about three or lower, just like you said. However, the fact that there's a lot of Social Security, regardless of what the number is, I'm, I'm still OK with it. But I think your point is you should have some conservative investments in case the market goes down. You're pulling from those. So you let the market recover. So you're not pulling from a down market and making this even worse. Jason needs to plan out a retirement income strategy. I agree. Right. right. So this is just the first part of it. I think we want to look at the numbers, which is great. Yeah. Because before people would call in and say, hey, I got a hundred thousand. I'm spending seventy five thousand a year. Can I retire? Right. And it's like, well, no. Right. (laughs) If you live one year, if you live, yeah, have, have at it. Go, go for it, brother. <laughs> um, but now people are getting it. Right? They're like, okay, I understand a 4% withdrawal rate. I know that I need enough assets at least to cover that. But then now we're getting a little bit more complex because Jason's not 65, he's 56. So yeah. we're probably looking at more than a 25 3% burn rate. Yeah. And then you look at, all right, where's the money going to come from? So the next layer is to look at taxation. Sure. So he's done a good job of having a little bit of diversification. He's got a million dollars in a brokerage account, which is awesome. That's wonderful. Yeah. And then he's got, you know, another, what, $1.4 million in a retirement account. And he's got a hundred thousand in a Roth. So his strategy over the next 10 years before social security, you know, should be a conversion strategy, probably up to the 12% tax bracket, but that's going to add more dollars to his clip already of a hundred thousand, right? Because he wants to spend 90. And if he's going to do conversions to get that 1.5 into a Roth over the next several years, maybe it's a 10 or 15 year plan. You know, it's going to be more than that. So his distribution rate is going to go higher because he has to pay that money to pay the tax to get it into the Roth. Right. Right. And then he has to look at a conservative income play in regards to where he's going to pull his income from to, to live off of. Because if all his portfolio is this growth value play off of dividends, you got to be careful and have to have a safety um, uh, safety valve. So, and I've got one other caution, and that is, um, it's it's difficult, at least in our experience, to go from making two hundred seventy five thousand a year to spending ninety. So, are you sure? So, so when when I said I think this is okay, that's at ninety grand. I'm taking you at your word, right? Right, and. But even still, with some of these factors you brought up, uh, Jason, you you still may want to have a side gig or part time work or something just to help supplement, just just in case there's a market downturn or things don't go quite as well as you're thinking. Right, and he's probably spending ninety thousand because he's got two and a half million dollars saved well, at saving fifty five. Yeah, you know, but just the the feeling. If, if he's fine, right? If, if we tell him, you know, spitball back of the envelope, yeah, I, I think you're good from a numbers perspective. If I was going to retire tomorrow or at age 56, um, I would want to really dive into the numbers and get super tight on where what the plan's going to look like. Yeah, so you're saying it's it should be more than a spitball analysis it, to whether it, you retire or not. Yes, and I think Jason is smart enough to yeah. probably do that. Right, right. But then he's got the confidence. Then work is optional. Then, right. you know, if someone writes in and says, Joe, you're jackass or whatever, then I'm out. I'm just going to walk out of the studio and say, I'm done. <laughs> I don't care. I've done my plan. I'm ready to go. Right. Right. But if, but I make $200,000 a year or Jason's making $275,000 a year, that's added confidence. It's like, man, do I really want to give up that paycheck? Yep. Right. Oh, that feels pretty good. Even though I'm going to just put up with this BS another year, another year, another year, just because of that, 
Sure. But if you get dialed in in your overall planning and then work is absolutely optional at that point, then that gives you the confidence to kind of pull the trigger whenever you want. Yep. I agree with everything you said, but from a quick spitball, the numbers look okay. All right. But there's a lot more to it. Good luck, Jason. Uh, let's get grab a uh, Coors Light sometime. No matter how far along you are on the path to retirement, decisions you make today will affect your financial security for years to come. Download Cracking the Financial Code at Any Age, a free guide that'll walk you through actions to take in your 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s to create a more successful retirement and to overcome previous financial missteps. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to go to the show notes and download the guide for free. Now, while you're there, check out FIRE, Financial Independence, or FAD. That's the YMYW TV episode on the Financial Independence Retire Early Movement. If you've got money questions, comments, suggestions, or stories to tell us, click Ask Joe and Big Al on air in the podcast show notes and leave the fellows a voice message or send us an email. Hi, Joe and Big Al. Love your show. It's full of great information and fun annex. Uh, FYI, I don't find you arrogant, Joe. I love your humor. Yeah, I, I second that. Oh, man, so do I. <laughs> uh, my current favorite drink is ginger ale and whiskey. All right. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, whiskey ginger. <laughs> uh, surprise, surprise. My question has to do with Roths. However, it's not about a conversion, but rather tax implications. I understand that the amount converted will be taxed as ordinary income. So my question is, when I convert from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, and I'm using other money from my taxable brokerage account to cover the taxes, when do I have to pay the taxes? Do I have to make an estimated tax payment when I convert the money to avoid underpaying my taxes and thus avoiding the underpayment penalty? Or can I pay them before April 15th? Yet after I've done my 1040 tax return, when I'll know exactly how much I will owe. My goal is to avoid underpayment tax penalties. Also, if the answer is that I have to make an estimated tax payment, can I just send one of the estimated tax payment vultures? Vouchers. Vouchers. I mean, they are, the IRS is a bunch of vultures. <laughs> I like how you kind of licked up at me there. Yeah, it's too. like, hmm, hmm. did I just hear that? <laughs> payment vultures. You pause to see if I heard it. Is my headphones <laughs> Let's see. I, something's wrong with my ears, Joe. It's the name of my band, IRS <laughs> Payment Vultures. Oh, man. Without sending in. Okay. All right. Yes. I have $1.3 million in a brokerage account. So that is by far the best option for me paying taxes on the conversion. I can easily pay the taxes all at once and want me to spread it out over four estimated tax vultures. <laughs> Vo v vouchers. Vouchers. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your help and keep the humor coming. I like vultures better. I think you should start calling them that. <laughs> Part of the new uh, YMYW language. Estimated tax vultures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's four of those per year. So bad. Well, let me just, I'll, I'll try to simplify because oh, I, I can I can go real complicated and then you'll roll your eyes, Joe. So so the, the answer is. <laughs> I like this answer though, because we get that we get this I know, question. I, I know we do. So so the answer is, is maybe. Sure. <laughs> but so I would say if you make an estimated pay, if you do a Roth conversion, you may have to pay uh, estimated payments and those start the quarter that you're in, right? So if you make it in December, you would just have to make one estimated payment. If, if you make it in March, you might have to do four estimated payments, but there's these, there's these exceptions, right? So in other words, if you have plenty of withholding already to cover last year's tax, you don't have to do estimates. I don't want to go into all that right now. Just, just know that if you do a Roth conversion, you may have to make an estimated payment. Just get with your accountant to figure that out. But the rule is what, 110%? It's a, it's a hundred percent. If your current year withholding, is 100% of last year's tax or 90% of this year's expected tax, then you don't have to pay a penalty by not paying an estimated payment, even though you owe on April 15th. But if your income's over 150 grand, you got to do 110%. So there's some nuances, but two, two quick points. One is if you need to make estimated payments, yeah, you can make it all at one time. You don't have to do four, just make a one big one in April if you want to. Second point though is, that you know, I the the goal is to avoid underpayment tax penalty. It's really that's an interest charge. It's three percent. It's not that much. It's a couple of bucks. I mean, I wouldn't even worry about it. I mean, yeah, if you need to make the estimated payments, 
calculate it and go pay it. But if you don't make it, it's not the end of the world. In fact, you're probably earning more than 3% in your account anyway. Some people get very upset by paying the IRS I know. A, an extra penny. I get it. All right, Lori, thank you very much for the email. Thank you for the information you shared during today's session of the tax in retirement. Um, so Andy, you're just pulling everything out of here. He emailed us a question from a webinar. Well, shouldn't we just reply? Oh, you know, we'll answer it like this. Can you please help me with this burning question? I plan to convert $200,000 from my traditional IRA to Roth this year. This would bring my tax bracket to 24%. Should I do the Roth conversion when I do not have the cash to pay the tax due to the withdrawal? I would have to request my financial institution to withhold 20% of Fed and 10% California. Thank you. Hong. Um, okay. There's nowhere near enough information. If he's on, okay. So do you withhold money out of the IRA to do the conversion? And the answer is maybe. Well, first of all, you would not do it if you're under 59, 59 and a half because of the tax penalties. So it's a 10% penalty for the feds. It's a two and a half percent penalty for California. So that would be dumb to have to pay a penalty to pay the taxes on the Roth conversion. It just makes that too expensive. Right. If, and so be careful because I've seen this happen before in the past is that someone would do a Roth conversion and they're under 59 and a half and they just withheld the taxes. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, I'm just going to withhold. It's like, don't with, ever withhold taxes if you can't afford, I mean, if, if you can afford to. Because if you're under 59 and a half, then you're going to be surprised with that 10% penalty. In this case, he's going to be in the 24% tax bracket. And he's like, I want to convert 200,000 bucks. Where does he coming up with the $200,000? I have no idea what, how, well, where is, is that going to bring him to the top of the 24% tax bracket? Maybe. Or is that 100% of his IRA? Yeah. We, yeah, you're right. We don't know. So assuming it's the, to the top of the 24, which would be an okay thing to do, it would be it definitely, it's, it's always better if you can pay the tax with non-retirement accounts. The reason being is because then you end up with the full 200 or whatever the number is in the Roth instead of the 200 minus the 30% withholding between federal and state. And furthermore, that withholding isn't even enough to pay the tax right. if you're under 59 and a half, because you're already said you're in the 24% bracket and the feds have a 10% penalty. So that's 34% plus 10, right? So now you're, you, you don't, you haven't, so now you have to go back and pull some more out <laughs> right. with some more penalty to pay the other. Exactly. Penalty. So here's exactly what's going to happen to Hong is that he's going to withhold 20% in tax for feds, 10%. And then he's going to get another tax bill in April Yeah, because it's like, damn it. I, just, I withheld 20%, but you, you didn't withhold it up. <laughs> so I got to pull out another hundred thousand to get 20% <laughs> the following year. You got another tax bill. <laughs> he's going to have to go back to his retirement account to pay the tax because he has no cash or any outside right. assets. So he's going to like, oh man, I owe 20,000 in extra tax. So he goes to the 401k plan, pulls $20,000 out, pays the IRS next year. Yeah, He's got another tax because he pulled 20,000 out. He's got another 10% yeah. penalty plus another 24% tax on that. At least it's probably a diminishing number. So each year it's a little bit less. Yeah, each year's a little bit less 25 painful. year process to get it paid off. So yeah, that $200,000 Roth conversion costs you 400,000. <laughs> the taxes <laughs> now hong if you're if you're over 59 and a half so here, here's what we would need to know there is is what kind of assets that you have what kind of fixed income what kind of tax bracket are you going to be in retirement is that does it make sense to do this in the 24 percent bracket and have and pay the taxes out of that now if you're over 59 and a half there's not a penalty so it'd be more likely to be an okay idea but we don't have enough information yep yeah careful with that <laughs> Hi, Joe, Alan, Andy. I've listened to many of your YouTube videos, but have never heard the answer to my question. Okay. Are you sure we haven't answered this? <laughs> have I've, you listened to all four, 500? How I mean, many podcasts do we have? Do, do we uh, answer this question? I remember this uh, intro. No, skip this one because she's got a very long story, which you can oh. choose to read or not. <laughs> oh, this is the short version. Okay. Yep. I think we did skip it. Okay, briefly, I have $1.4 million in qualified accounts and will retire um, or cut back hours next July. I am not worried about running out of money, but I'm very worried about RMDs that will begin at age 72. Uh, that's in January 2027. I know we are always told to pay the taxes for Roth conversions from savings, but I don't have the savings to use. 
uh, since I want to keep my $50,000 cash for down payment on a senior coop. Co op. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Not like a chicken coop, Joe. <laughs> I thought it was a, I don't know, I thought it was going to cruise around in like a little it's, it's car. A little, uh, yeah, convertible. Got it. Um, is there still such things as co-ops? Yeah. Yes. Back East. Got Not, it. We've never heard uh, co-ops here, but back East, it's a thing. I, I believe. Isn't that right, Andy? I believe so. Yeah. Are you from out East, Andy? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I know people. Got it. All right. Are you looking for, are you in the, are you in the, um, um, I'm not looking for a coop. No, no, you're not looking for a, you're not in the market for a nope. senior coop. No, nope. <laughs> got it. All right. We always have to pay the taxes on a 401k IRA withdrawal. So why is it such a big deal? If I pay the taxes from the account before I get the funds of the sale for my house in 2023 or 2024, I consider a percentage of my 401k IRA belongs to uncle Sam and not mine anyways. I don't understand why we always hear that we need to make the money paid in taxes um, back to get to ground zero. The taxes were not money that belonged to me. I don't know where she's going with this. <laughs> I do not plan to need the Roth and we'll leave it to not money that belonged to me. No, no, no. And we'll leave it to heirs. Oh, okay. <laughs> you see, went back to the start of the same line. line. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really hard to read this. I got to tell you. <laughs> This is the short version. I will donate a portion of my qualified accounts to charity. I have a longer version with much more detail, uh, but would first like to know if you want to tackle this question. Uh, no one really addresses this issue, and I've been trying to find an answer. Uh, thanks. Uh, from Ellen from Minnesota. A yeah. reluctant retiring RN. Reluctant retiring nurse. She doesn't want to retire. Or does she not want to be a nurse? I don't know. I, I guess she's reluctant that. to retire, probably. That's what, how I read it. Yeah. Or if she loves her job. I'm from Minnesota. Yeah. I've never heard of a co-op in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if it works well, with it's my because sister. you would never were a senior citizen when you lived there. I got it. Got it. You could have put your mom in a co-op. I, I should have. <laughs> <laughs> Instead oh. of buying her a house. Oh, uh, I love my mom. <laughs> yeah, it shows. <laughs> I know you do. Um, it's just a joke. Okay. So uh, I guess Ellen's question is, is why can't she pay the taxes from a Roth conversions from the retirement account? Yeah. And it seems like we answered that a couple of weeks ago and four weeks ago. And so we have, we actually have talked about it quite often. Yeah. So it's not our first choice, but in many circumstances, we're just fine with it. So here's why it's not our first choice is it's because, well, first of all, if you're under 59 and a half and you pay the taxes out of your IRA or 401k, you have to pay a 10% early withdrawal penalty with the withholding part. So that seems kind of dumb, right? The second thing is if you're over 59 and a half and if you've got funds outside of retirement, wouldn't you rather pay the tax with your non-retirement funds because you get more money into the Roth? I mean, that's kind of best of all worlds. But sometimes you yeah, you want to maximize the amount of money right. that you get in the Roth. Right. So so if you got a hundred thousand conversion, wouldn't you want to have a hundred thousand in the con, you know, in the in, Roth, in the Roth. And, and take your twenty-five thousand, let's say you're, it's yeah. twenty-five K in cash, you take that from another account. Yeah, if you can, not everybody can, not everyone has funds outside of retirement accounts. And we would say this, yes, it's fine to do that as long as you're converting in a low enough tax bracket to where it makes sense. I mean, that's actually the more important question is should you do a conversion? And if so, how much? You wanna look at your tax bracket today versus your tax bracket in 2027 when you turn 72, what's that bracket gonna be? So you don't wanna convert in a higher bracket today to, to have a lower bracket later. So just do some math to figure out how much to convert. But if, if you're a good candidate to convert because your tax bracket's low enough and you have no funds outside of retirement, sure, go for it. Right. Yeah, you, you, you got to calculate the amount of tax first that you do the conversion and making sure that you keep yourself in the same bracket. Because we've seen this that, all right, you're going to pay the tax out of the 401k or IRA, whatever that you are converting, and you have like a three or four year conversion plan. And so you convert 100,000 just hypothetically, but you don't withhold any taxes. Then next year in April, you have a $25,000 tax bill. And so where does the money come from? You're pulling it from the IRA. So you pull the $25,000 from the IRA and you pay tax on that to pay the tax, right? And then you want to do another conversion, but you don't have the cash to pay the tax. So it's just this other, 
it's a flowing thing. You're paying tax to pay the tax to pay the tax to pay the tax. It kind of free falls. So just make sure that you keep yourself in that same bracket um, because you don't want to pull out more in a higher bracket to pay the tax when you did a conversion in a lower bracket. Okay, I got you. That all made sense? Yes, sir. You can listen to the two most recent episodes besides this one that include discussions of paying that tax on the Roth conversion out of your retirement accounts. I've linked to them in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Now, another option is to have a certified financial planner professional look over your financial situation to help you craft a more comprehensive retirement plan that's specific to your needs and goals. In a free financial assessment, the highly trained professionals on Joan Big Al's team at Pure Financial Advisors can tell you if Roth conversions make sense for you. They can walk you through your options for paying that tax on conversion, and they can provide money-saving insight into all other aspects of your financial life. And they can do it at no cost or obligation to you. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to go to the show notes and click get an assessment. Schedule a free financial assessment via Zoom, no matter where you are in the country, at a time and date that is convenient for you. Joe and Al love the show. A rare balance of great information and many laughs. Thank you. Thank you. I'm 60, married and recently retired at the end of August 2021. My wife was a stay-at-home mom, so no income from her. We have $1.7 million in an IRA and $200,000 in a 401k with a recent employer. We will live off of savings for 2022, so we will have zero taxable income. Too young to take Social Security. We don't want to draw on the RIA yet. We file our taxes as married. Finally, jointly, we love to roll over and convert our 401k to a Roth IRA. My 401k plan does offer a Roth option. If I understand the 2021 tax tables, can't find any details on 2022 tax tables, the high end of the 12% tax bracket is 81,050. Add the 25,100 standard deduction to the total amount we can convert would be 106,150 and pay the 12% tax rate. Is this correct? Yes, sir. You yep. are absolutely R- correct. Right on track. So what um, what he's doing is just taking the top of the 12% tax bracket. If you go to the IRS and look at the tax tables for married, finally joint taxpayer, the top of the 12% tax bracket, taxable income is 81050 So then he's adding back the standard deduction because he will have zero income coming from any sources. Sure. Except for he wants to create income by taking money from his 401k or, or IRA to convert. Right. And so he wants to know what is the most that he could convert and pay that 12% tax bracket. So he's doing the math. The top of the uh, 12% is 8150. And then the 25,100, you add those two together is 106,150. Uh, so yes, sir, that is correct. So anyone else that's keeping score, that's what you would, well, that's the math you want to calculate. Right. If you would want, if so, what should I do with the additional $95,000 left in the 401k? Should I convert it all at once uh, and pay 22% tax on everything above the 106, 150? I'm not sure if I can do a Roth conversion from a 401k to Roth IRA in consecutive years, or if the conversion is a one-time event. I'd be able to not take any taxable income in 2023 as well, if that helps. Thanks for your help. Buckeye Bill in Stowe, Ohio. Stowe? Stowe. Yeah, I think so. Is that Stowe? I guess it could be Stow. Stow? I'm going to say Stowe. Stowe. Okay, (laughs) Buckeye Bill. That's kind of a cool name. Great name. Um, You could do multiple conversions, Bill. Sure. Or Buckeye. Yeah, Buckeye. So, all right, my 401k plan does offer a Roth option. So he's 60. He's retired. He's going to retire at the end of August, at the end of this month. So, Bill, this is what you do. You take the 401k dollars. You move it into an IRA. And we're not giving advice, too. We're talking. 
It's just spitballing. It's just spitballing. It's based upon what little information we have. We yeah. we try our best. We do. So just, you know, hypothetically, just throw the stuff in. Keep it in the 401k. I could care less. Or you might want to think about moving it into an IRA. And then from there, you could take the money from the IRA into a Roth. You could do the full um, $106,150 6150 to get to the top of the 12% tax bracket this year and do the remaining next year. And you'd pay 12% this year and 12% next year. Yeah. And you still have uh, 1.7 million in IRA start attacking that too. Yeah. So he's looking at the 401k and he's thinking, Oh, I have a Roth option in the 401k. So should I do an inner plan conversion? So he's got a provision in the plan, but it does. You have to look at the plan doc to see if it allows for a conversion within the plan because some plans don't allow an inner plan conversion, even though that you can contribute to the Roth component of the plan. Yeah. I, I think given the situation, what I would do is I would take the 401k money, roll that into an IRA first. So you just have one account, simplify Let, Let's get simple here. And then you convert whatever you want to, to 106,000, right. To get to the top of the 12% bracket, you can do the same thing again next year. All good. That one of the problems with having an IRA and a 401k, and I know you're only 60, so I'm going to project that you will be 72 someday, is if you have two accounts like that, you're going to have to have two different required minimum distributions. You're going to have two different statements. You're going to have two different investment uh, uh, strategies to try to follow. It just gets more complicated. It seems to me it'd be better to have it in one account. It's, it's interestingly enough when you have multiple IRAs, which I would say just get one, you don't need multiple, but if you have multiple IRAs, you only need to take one RMD from the IRA of any IRA. If you have a 401k, if you have five old 401ks, you have to take an RMD, required minimum distribution from all five plans. It's just, it's too much to keep track of. Another thing too, is that if he wants to do the inner plan conversion, so he's got $200,000 in the 401k, he wants to convert the $200,000 into the Roth 401k. You can do that. Just understand that the Roth 401k will still have a required minimum distribution while the Roth IRA does not have a required minimum distribution. Yeah, that's a good point. Age 72. That, that's a little known fact, right? Right. So, um, so yeah. But I, I don't know why he's getting caught up. So many people get caught up because he has two plans. Right. Well, let me convert this. But you still have 1.7 in pre-tax accounts. Yeah. So you still have issues. That, that's the bigger issue, right? The, the, the bigger issue is you have $1.9 million in a pre-tax account. Yeah. And that's what you want to tackle for the next 12 years. It's not the 200000 in the 401k. I mean, yes, that's, I mean, 200000 is a chump change, but 1.7 is kind of the bigger animal. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, you want to kind of take a look at uh, both um, accounts as one because they're still pre-tax. Just roll them together and go from there. Yeah. All right. That's all we got today, folks. All right. That's pretty good. Yeah. There's Sorry. Jim on, on page four if you wanted to do another short one. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think we're good. I'm good. Stick around for virtual commuting, beer, blood brothers, and recycled jokes in the derails at the end of the episode. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. Click the Get an Assessment button in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com or call 888-994-6257 to schedule your free financial assessment video call. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. That's so, interesting. I can just visualize Adam. Yeah. He's like, okay, instead of getting, he's getting in his he's car. He's getting my car. But he's just so, going to so, listen to the so podcast. So to speak, yeah. <laughs> but he's not going to drive anymore. He'll, he'll walk around and do his 10,000 steps. Yeah, he's separate. That's his commute. Yeah, he's he's like, se- separates. Okay. Can I maybe go in the garage? <laughs> Sit in the car. Could listen that. to it. Right? Right. Just don't pull anywhere out or just walk around the house. That's right. And, uh, you know. Is the rest of his family? Don't bug me. Yeah. I'm commuting. I'm commuting right now. <laughs> hey, Dad, um, shut up. I'm commuting. I'm not here. <laughs> I'm not here. Can't you tell? <laughs> I'm driving to work right now. Uh, In my head. <laughs> All I got to do is just 
taste a little bit of Coors Light and it's just the world just changes out. Apparently I need to call Coors Light and see if they'll sponsor the show. Now we're actually getting them drinkers? Well, wow. interestingly enough, it's not widely known, but I actually like Coors Light too. But I actually like more flavorful beers as well, but I find that I can only handle about one or two. And so then I switch to a lighter beer. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm a Coors Light drinker. Now, if I only drove a Civic, then we would be like brothers, brothers. for life. Yeah. Blood brothers. You oh, would. Man. I would slice my yep. hand up and slice his up and shake it. <laughs> Put like Whoa. a bandana around it. I was getting what? brutal here. Have you, did you ever isn't, have? Uh, isn't that Blood Brothers? And you, you've never seen that before? Where you cut off a hand? No, you just cut like a <laughs> slice in your palm. It. Get a little blood. Yeah. yeah you, I was it. imagining that you were cutting off the hand. I'm not cutting off the hand of my Blood Brother here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going shopping for a Honda Civic tomorrow. Well, you should, have you ever driven a Civic? I, no, I don't think I could fit them. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to have a sunroof. <laughs> or you could sit in the back seat. Yeah, I you could. know, like. Remember the back basketball players yep. used to sit in the back seat of the bugs hanging bugs. Yep. Take out the front seat. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Ed Two Tall Jones. He did that in that in the movie um, Police Academy. Yeah. I think we've already had a reference of that once before. We have. We everything. <laughs> it, we've already done <laughs> we've this. Done this. We have a very <laughs> limited number of jokes. Same joke. <laughs> a billion times. Same joke. Same references. <laughs> <laughs> so apologize if we just did it last week because we've already forgotten. All right. Thanks. I bet you he's from Minneapolis and just didn't tell us. You think he is? I bet he is. I bet you looked him up. I bet no, you of course exactly I didn't, what, but he drinks what, Coors Light what, what, because of you, green, Joe. Though. I mean, no. I mean, Coors Light's not a Minnesota beer. No. It's, it's a Colorado beer. It is a Colorado beer. Like, if, if they're from Minnesota, they're going to say, like, Grain Bell. Yeah, but he's blood brothers with you. and I mean, come on. Yeah. If he's from he's Minnesota, it would be like, I drive... You know, Ford F-150 and I think <laughs> Grain Belt. You ever had Grain Belt? No. Never heard of Grain it. Belt beer? No. no. It's delicious. Is it? Yeah, it's a little heavy, but okay. compared yep. to, you know, Coors Light. Coors Light. Light. Yeah, everything. Can you even great. get it here? <laughs> Everything's. Grain Belt? Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think so.